Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Clark and musicians and tech team. Well, we are in Habakkuk again this morning, so you may turn to Habakkuk, and then we're going to pray together here as well. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this morning, for the chance to worship you with these beautiful songs of praise to your wonderful name, to gather here live and face-to-face with these in the room, and even to gather live with those who are watching online. And we're so thankful for each group and so thankful that you, in your Spirit's power, have held us together so strongly during this time. What a joy it is, Lord, to hear words of encouragement from those here and especially from those who aren't here, just reminding us that they're still connected with us and still very much an active part of the body. And so bless each group today, Lord, please. Lord, let your spirit please fall on this place and take your word and give us a renewed sense of your glory, a renewed sense of your awe and majesty and your trustworthiness. Help us today, Lord, to surrender to you in every way. And Lord, as we pray for sister churches and missionaries, we pray for First Baptist Church of Berlin today. Pray that you'd do a great, great work there, that you would equip them, protect them, use them in that community. And then for Megan, serving in North Africa and the Middle East, we just pray for her, Lord, just her very listing here on my card sheet uh, shows that she's in a dangerous area, an area where she has to be very careful. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would protect her in every way. You'd give her wisdom, and you would let her ministry be effective in reaching people with the gospel and discipling them to reach others. And we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 2 this morning as we continue through the book of Habakkuk. You're probably starting to learn where Habakkuk is by now, maybe. Uh, It's that little sliver of a book in there in the Minor Prophets. Whenever I was, my, I guess it was, yeah, second church staff position, I was a minister to youth in a church in North Dallas, and do you remember back when the pastors would sit up on the platform up here during the sermon, and I always called that the Sanhedrin seats, uh, but uh, anyway, it was with good intention, but we just, we don't do that anymore, <clears throat> but, but this was back in that day, and I always hated when the pastor preached from a minor prophet, because you don't want to be up there flipping, you know, for a long, long time, you know, looking at it. Habakkuk chapter 2, we'll be in verses 5 through 20, and we're going to work through the text little by little today, rather than read the whole thing at once. You may have seen, as I did, this past week there was a, a video online and was from Portland and, and the protests there, and stay on focus, stay on, stay on track. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> there was uh, uh, this particular lady, and the police were coming kind of in a, a wall, and they were clearing a street, and so the, they were telling everyone, you need to get back, you need to get back, and so this lady began to yell and curse at the police not once, not twice, but three times getting in their face and asking, what if I don't get back? And again with expletives. And suddenly she kind of disappeared behind a wall of police. And uh, you don't see her again, but it appears that she was then led to a police van ready to escort her to jail. Uh, The police are our friends. And when you oppose any authority, things don't go well. And it was just, I I, I saw that and I was thinking about this week's text and it was just so graphic the way that because of the darkness and the wall of police, she just, she's gone. I mean, she was safe and and taken to jail, I'm sure, but, but she just was gone. She was arrogant, boisterous, in their faces, and then, boop, you don't see her anymore. This is like the message in the prophecy given to Habakkuk about the Chaldeans, And then there's a message for me and a message for you today as well as we read Habakkuk chapter 2. We pick up where we left off there in verse 5, speaking about the Chaldeans. And you'll remember that Habakkuk is concerned because 
There's so much uh, immorality. There's so much idolatry. There's so much turning away from the Lord in the Lord's people in, in Judah. And so he complains to God, and then God says, I hear, I see, I'm answering, and I'm sending judgment, but I'm sending it through the evil, wicked Chaldeans. And then we saw Habakkuk complaining to God about how could you judge your people through the wicked Chaldeans. And so then he's waiting on God's answer, and then we saw last time that God said, here's the answer, write it down, send it to the people. And so at verse five he says, furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. Now, he's speaking about the Chaldeans here. They, they were known for their, uh, their love of alcohol, and so it's, there's going to be a couple of notes in here in this passage that are regarding that. But it's speaking about the Chaldeans as they had been marching through the land, taking nation after nation, ruthlessly, brutally conquering nation after nation. So he's speaking of the Chaldeans here, and uh, as with many times, their, their love for alcohol is even going to be a part of their demise. And there's another sermon in that for us, but I do remind you of that. But what happens next is that we have five woes listed in three verse triplets. And the woes that will come to the Chaldeans later. Oh, we are such an impatient people. I'm so impatient. You know, our entire nation, as, as long of a history as it has, it's a very short time. And here this prophecy is given about what's going to happen to the Chaldeans in about 65 years. And so God's saying to Habakkuk, encourage the people, hey, only about 65 more years. Wow. I have a little trouble, and I want to send out a prayer request when God says only about 65 more minutes. But it will come to pass and so he begins to talk about the woes that will come to the evil, wicked Chaldeans. Beginning in verse 6, 6, 7, and 8, will not all of these, all of these nations that they've gathered and just put into their pocket, if you will, will not all of these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, woe to him who increases what is not his, this is Chaldea. That's what they're doing. They're just taking. It's not theirs. For how long and makes himself rich with loans or pledges? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them because you have looted many nations. All the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all of its inhabitants. The thief will be robbed of all. Suddenly, he says, and we know now because of history, this is exactly what did happen in 539 B.C. They were suddenly, the Scripture tells us over in Daniel 5, and history points to the fact that they were defeated in one night. And so they're, they're, they're accumulating all of these nations unto themselves, and he says, it will come back to get you suddenly, and you will fall suddenly, and the thief who has taken what is not his will be robbed of all. But he goes on in verses 9 through 11, speaking of the arrogant who will be humbled. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high. He, he's, he's raising himself up in, in arrogance and <clears throat> in self-promotion. To be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples, so you are sinning against yourself. Oh, isn't that true? We sin against ourselves. We think we're cheating God and we're going to find a loophole to go against God's ways, and we're the only ones who are being harmed. Verse 11, <clears throat> surely the stone will cry out from the wall, and the rafter will answer it from the framework. This, this beautiful picture of, uh, of, of everything in the whole world is crying out against you, Chaldeans. It's going to come back to haunt you. The arrogant will be humbled. Then there's this couplet, triplet, verses 12 through 14. 
<clears throat> the corrupt will be corrupted. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that peoples toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. This, we have these five triplets, these five woes, and here after these first three, there's an intermission. There's this pause for God to, to remind Habakkuk and to remind the readers of this prophecy and to remind us of this powerful truth. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's this beautiful, poetic, powerful picture of God proclaiming through Habakkuk as he does over and over through the Scriptures and wants to do over and over in our day and through our lives. As God declares, I will be glorified. Everyone will know the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. You think, Chaldeans, he says, you're prospering and you're indefensible, indefeatable, and that nothing could ever stop you or conquer you. But you and everyone else by what I do to you will know the glory of the Lord and it will spread all through the earth. And the Chaldeans will be gone. Indeed, as I mentioned in 539 B.C., you remember there in Daniel chapter 5, the writing on the wall. There's Belshazzar, and he is having his drunken feast, and he is glorifying himself. And he says, we, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, will never be conquered. And they were gone. The Medo-Persians took them, and they were gone. A little later, they even tried to rebel against Darius. And in his retaliation to them, they suffered the same brutalities that they had exerted and done to all the nations of the earth. With one flick of his little finger, God destroys nations. How many times in the 7,000 or so years of this earth's history have there been rulers and nations and individuals who have thought, God can't stop me. I finally found a way against God. God is just a religious myth. He's nothing to me. And then in an instant, they're gone. Oh, I read in my quiet time a couple of weeks ago that wonderful story there where God destroys 185,000 Assyrians in one night with no help, using no one. Things are impossible. You can't do that unless you're God. Where's Hitler? Where's Mussolini? Where's Hirohito? Where's Saddam Hussein? Where's Napoleon? And on and on and on and on, these, these conquerors who were just gone. And we just remember them as history. God says, the earth will be filled. And God's will is that you and I are a part of that process by which the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Here's what we're after today. This balance between understanding that we must fear the Lord, we must understand his glory, his might, his ability to snuff us out, which is what I deserve. Right now, he could do that. We want to, the Scripture tells us, to build up the fear of the Lord in our lives. It's a good thing. It's a fountain, the Scripture says. It's the beginning of wisdom. So we want to fear the Lord, and simultaneously we want to place our faith in the Lord because the Scripture says He's a consuming fire, and so we have two choices. We can ride with Him, as we see that picture in Revelation of the saints having the privilege of riding with Him in victory, or we can be the object of his wrath. And so we blend these two together as we study his word and ask the Lord to beautifully remind us to lift him up and then to be thankful that because of the cross, we aren't his enemy if we've come to know Christ 
and we're by his side as he brings justice and judgment on the earth. There's that one who's a believer who doesn't want to go against the Lord. We all do go against the Lord. We're still sinners until we get to heaven. But there's that believer that we want to be who keeps short accounts with God, who knows that we fall, who the Spirit reminds us, and we're sensitive, and we're thankful for the cross. We just keep taking it back to the cross and just keep getting back up to follow the Lord, imperfectly just following the Lord while failing and stumbling. There's that believer who truly knows Christ but has that season in their life where they really go toe-to-toe with God and say, no, no, thank you, God. I have no interest in dealing with you about this area of my life, this attitude in my life. That's a dangerous place to be. The cross, if we've come to know Christ, yes, the cross is enough, but God allows consequences in my life and in your life. Why? Because he loves us so much and because he will be glorified. He wants us to be on his side. He will be glorified. It's a lot more enjoyable when God is glorified through my obedience than when God is glorified through my disobedience. He will be glorified. And then there's that one. You may be here today. You may be watching online. You don't know the Lord, and you're going toe-to-toe with the Lord. That's the most dangerous place to be because he has the right, the authority to snuff you out today, and you haven't come to know the Lord. The difference between you and a believer is that you haven't repented of your sin. Believers aren't perfect. Believers are sinners, but they've put their faith in Christ alone as the payment for our sin and our desire because the Spirit of God lives in us is to follow after him, though imperfectly. But his glory will fill the earth. I read yesterday in my quiet time, Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. No one in all the earth has ever devised a plan against God and succeeded. Now, sometimes it looks that way, like it did with the Chaldeans. It looked like they were succeeding, and yet they were evil. Do you remember when you were a child and you're playing in an unsupervised room, maybe it's at school, maybe it's at home, and you're, you're, you're pushing the limits a little bit and then a little bit more, and then you begin to believe as children, I think we can do whatever we want to do. I think we're just going to get away with anything we want to in this room because nothing's ever going to happen. I always had the, the unique gift of being the child with my back to the door, and so we'd be just having our merry time, and all of a sudden, all of my friends would go coldly limp, and their eyes got really big, And then I turned around and found out why. Because it always comes to an end. And God does that because he deserves glory. And he loves us and he wants us to be riding with him during these times. It's true for the Chaldeans. It's true for me. So there's the one today that needs to be reminded. God will be glorified through our obedience or disobedience So in those things that I have no idea about but that God's speaking to you about today, just get right with him. Come to know him as your savior, or if you know him as your savior, just admit to him what he's telling you. You're right, God. Help me. Help me to turn and follow you. And then there's the one today who needs to be reminded. God wins. Walk in faith, as we saw in chapter 2, verse 4. The Chaldeans did fall. Your enemy, who is the devil... It's not your in-law or anyone else. It's the devil. He falls. He loses. He's already been declared the loser. But we go on here. Verse 15 through 17. The one who leads others astray will be lost. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, his cup of vengeance and justice. And utter disgrace will come upon your glory, for the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all of its inhabitants." And then this last triplet, 
about the futility of idolatry. And the scripture has so much to say about how stupid, that's the Hebrew word, <clears throat> idolatry is. What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? Its maker, this man, this woman, carves out, makes the idol, and then an an image, a teacher of falsehood, is saying, how can it teach you anything? You made it out of wood. For its maker trusts in his own handiwork. The, The builder, the maker of the idol is himself his own God because he's stronger than the thing he just made. When he fashions speechless idols, woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake, to a mute, arise, a mute stone, and that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it at all. Here in the Western world, it's hard for us to picture idols, and actually ours may be more dangerous because they're not so easily visible. Living in Japan for 10 years, we saw idols left and right. We saw this, this picture over and over and over. We saw little idols on the side of the road, little, little stone statues of men covered in raincoats so they wouldn't get wet, food put before them so that they wouldn't, have, wouldn't go hungry. And we'd think to ourselves, this is crazy. That's the exact opposite of what my God does. He shelters me. He feeds me. I don't feed him. see and hear stories as I would sometimes go and pray for the people who were going to pray at the temples and the shrines. I didn't go to pray at the temples and the shrines. Be careful to understand the difference. But to pray for them because they were so lost and so hopeless. Sometimes I would ask the people selling the little trinkets and prayer things because everything costs, you know, a dollar here and two dollars here and the more you pay, the better your prayers have a chance. And So I'd ask the workers just out of curiosity to see what they'd say. You know, what's going on here? What's happening? They, they usually had no idea what they were doing and what this was supposed to mean. And tell me about the God of this temple. Well, he's gone right now. He's been carried off to another temple. And folks are clapping their hands and throwing the money in and worshiping these things that make no sense. But God would say to us in the Western world, oh, you have idols. Some of them are physical. Let someone take your goodie, your toy, your gadget away for a little while. You may find some of your idols. But he says, how can you trust in what you have made? You've made yourself the God. In verse 20, this is what we sang about with Pastor Clark, but the Lord is in his holy temple. No one carried him off. He's not temporarily gone. In Japan, you ring a bell to wake up the God. You don't need to wake up the Lord. He never sleeps. He never grows weary. He never grows tired. Let all the earth be silent before him. Philippians 2 tells us this is what will happen, that every knee will bow And every tongue will confess, some too late, some on time. Which one will you be? His, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. You may be here today and feel like you're just cruising along and you're kind of surprised, actually. You know you're living in sin. You're a little surprised how well it's going for you. Oh, oh, brother and sister, the day will come that you'll wish that you repented today. You ever build a card house? Two story, three story, four story? I've got some kids that are pretty good at card houses. Pretty impressive. Until someone opens the door to the room and the, just the breeze of the door knocks it all down. There's some in this room, there's some watching online, and you're living in a card house, and God is, is wooing you today. He loves you. This is why he left the glories of heaven, to die in my place, in your place. Just repent. Just admit what he already knows. Just admit what he's pounding away at you about. Oh, there's always regret. I have regret for my sin. But your sin has been paid for if you will only receive him as your Savior on the cross today. Come to him as Savior. Today, come back to him in that area of your life. And then others today, the message to you is to walk in faith because 
He will win. The Chaldeans did fall instantly. And then we see this picture of Babylon, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, over in Revelation 17 and 18, which we'll get to in the fall. We see that Babylon, or the new Babylon, but this same picture will also fall forever. The devil loses. The things that he's doing in your life, like the Chaldeans were about to do to Judah, God is using them. God is using them for his glory. He lets the devil have a little bit of freedom temporarily. He let the Chaldeans have a little bit of freedom temporarily. There are things he's allowing in your life that are not good, but he is so masterfully twisting it all into, melding it all into his will, and he's using it. And his message to you again today is walk in faith. Walk closely with him. Trust him. He's using this in ways that you could never know. So give him glory. Today, once again, submit to him again. Once again today, stopping and saying, God, I'm confused. I don't understand. There are a lot of things that don't make sense. But I want to be one who says today, I glorify you. I once again today, and I'll need to here in a couple hours again, put my trust back in you to trust that just like this confusing time with Habakkuk, you're moving and you're working in my life. Remember Balaam? Balaam was a non-Israelite seer of some sort. And King, King Balak of Moab hired him to come and to curse the Israelites. He couldn't quite get himself to curse the Israelites because the Lord kept filling his mouth with, with, with blessings over the Israelites. And so he was frustrated because he wanted to curse the Israelites. Balak was frustrated because this is what he hired him for. And as we piece together the rest of his story throughout the Scripture... We see that he taught the Moabites how they could deceive and ensnare the Israelite men into their own idol worship, and then God would judge them. And so he finally won. And he stayed there, probably a prominent man, because he'd helped them to have some success against Israel. Only problem is later, as the Israelites were taking the, the land given to the Reubenites, one of their 12 tribes, it seems that Balaam was just a casualty in the war. It was just all over. God will win. And he loves you. And he sends through Habakkuk to me and to you an encouragement. It's going to turn around. You just walk with the Lord by faith and keep trusting him and trusting him and trusting him. Moment after moment, day after day, because the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the land. And he is in his holy temple. And all the earth draws silent. We have all these questions. Oh, I'm going to ask God this. I'm going to ask God that. I don't think we're going to ask God a thing. I think we may learn in heaven. But when we first get there, we're going to not have any questions. We're going to be silent because of the awe of the glory of the Lord. Habakkuk had to be silent. The Chaldeans would be caused to be silent. And for a moment today, as we pray in a moment, could you just in your heart be silent and just say, God, I believe that you are who you say you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to me this week. <clears throat> Lord, help me as the devil tempts me. Help us as the devil tempts us to think that we can go against your ways and somehow succeed. Help us to have a healthy fear of you that appreciates, that clings to the fatherly, tender love that you have for us that you showed on the cross. And to let the contrast of your, your awe, your power, your terribleness, let that contrast daily remind us of how grateful we are for your tender love and mercy that you gave us on the cross. Lord, there are those watching online, perhaps here in this room, who don't know you as Savior. They believe you exist. They have a religious history, but they've never come to know you as Savior. Lord, today, may they come and say, I want to know this God who loves me that much who would die on the cross in my place. Lord, there are those who need to deal with you about some areas of their life. Or today, in your graciousness, you're reminding them, you're reminding us 
come back, repent, get right with me so that I don't have to send the consequences to do so. And then, Lord, build a deep sense of faith in us as believers today. Lord, in our weariness during this COVID season, in the relationship issues that are represented in this room, job issues, and on and on, build our faith to know that you will win and we will be there with you. Oh, move, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.